This morning's scripture reading will come from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. That's 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. And it reads, This is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report with them with our which, which are without, lest he falleth into reproach in the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, and then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be not excuse me, even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree, and a great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Again, good morning. Before we get into our lesson this morning, I want to remind everyone, hopefully you are aware, but our Vacation Bible School is this week. It starts on Wednesday. So I hope that you will make plans to be here, especially if you have kids or grandkids or neighbor kids or random kids. Just uh, bring some kids and show up. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday will be from 630 to 830. Is that right? I think so. Okay, yeah. I knew that. Uh, 630 to 830, and then uh, on Saturday is going to be from 10 to 3. All right, making sure I'm right on that one too. Uh, remember our challenge, if we have 100 kids that are 6th grade and below, uh, then on those a combined number of kids, 6th grade and below, so uh, on Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday, and Saturday, then we will have some, uh, some special treats on Saturday afternoon as part of that fun day. Uh, and if we don't, then uh, the people who live with me are going to have a lot of ice cream. So I hope that you will come and uh, make sure that we don't have to eat all that by ourselves. Make sure that you invite your friends. Uh, all of our our kids. We really want you guys to be here. Make sure that you are here. And invite your friends from school. Invite your friends from the neighborhood. Uh, please come and be a part of this. Adults, we still, I'm sure, need some help uh, this afternoon. There's going to be a uh, work day, so if you're willing to help with that, go grab some lunch. Come straight back to the building uh, and please help us with that. And then also everyone, there are some uh, postcards on the glass table in the back where the bulletins are. If you'll grab some of those, there are probably about 30 or so of those left. We would love for those all to be gone today uh, and given out today, tomorrow or two. Tuesday. So if you can help us with that, uh, please do that. There are also uh, some full sheet, eight and a half by 11 uh, flyers. If you want to just go to whatever restaurant you go to today uh, and post it in their window, don't ask, just do it. Uh, and post it in their window or leave it on your table or any of those types of things. Uh, we would certainly encourage you to do that, except for maybe the not asking part. Uh, but make sure we get the, the word out about this. One of my favorite holidays is coming up in just a little over a month, July 4th. Why do you think it's my favorite holiday? Well, of course, it's the food. Uh, there are hamburgers, and there are hot dogs, and there's watermelon, and there's pie with ice cream on top of it. There's just wonderful things about what is that July 4th, Independence Day. But when you think about July 4th, what do you think about? If you're like me, you probably think about the food uh, instead of Independence Day, what it actually is supposed to be reminding us about. Uh, what do you think that um, the British, uh, those who, who live in, in Great Britain, the English, if you will, what do you think they think about July 4th? Uh, probably people today probably don't care a whole lot. Uh, I saw a quote this morning as I was looking, thinking about this, and uh, someone, probably a naive American like most of us probably are, uh, asked someone from Great Britain, hey, do you guys have July 4th over there? And they said, no, we just skip from July 3rd to July 5th. We don't have July 4th. Uh, of course they have July 4th, but they don't, they don't celebrate it the same way that we do, right? It's not their Independence Day. What might they call it? The, the Rebels Day, or they might call it the Traitors Day, or any, any number of other things, right? And, and again, today, in, in our current culture, in our current world, it's, it's probably not a very big deal at all. Uh, we're, we're allies with, with that country, and we get along well, and uh, everything, everything is good, right? We watch their royal weddings, and they watch our celebrities, uh, and, and we both laugh at each other a little bit, probably. Um, but what do you think about those, those first few years after 
uh, Independence Day, after the, the Revolutionary War. You think about the, the War of 1812. That was another war against the British that was still for our independence because uh, the, the British wanted uh, the, uh, a way to get to the, the further west because we only had uh, the Louisiana Purchase at that time. We didn't own all of the uh, what we called the United States of America today. Uh, so they, they fought a war again with us, uh, still fighting for our independence, even in 1812, a number of years later after our uh, original Revolutionary War. There was probably some hard feelings. There probably were some people who, who genuinely thought of uh, Americans or uh, whatever they might have called us as, as traitors, as treacherous, as people who went against the government that was set up, went against the queen, went against the monarchy. You know, we, we, there are a lot of different types of governments in the world today, aren't there? Uh, there are monarchies. There are those who you know, have kings and queens. There are dictatorships. There are democracies. There's, uh, there are republics. There are totalitarian states. Uh, there, there are all kinds of different governments in the world today, and probably many more that we could think of. And what can happen? If you don't like the government that you're a part of, what can you do? You can revolt. You can have a revolution. You can overthrow the, the government. You can change from, from one type of government to another, and usually probably with much conflict and, and maybe even with, with death and, and, and fighting and war. But, but those things can change. You know, in, in the church today, in Christianity today, we see a lot of different types of church government, don't we? A lot of different types of church leadership. Uh, some groups that claim Christianity have individuals as the, the head of their church. Some of them have councils or commissions or conferences or synods or any number of other things. And, and those groups of people oftentimes, or even that individual sometimes, may, may make decisions that, that affect everyone in their particular group, their particular perhaps denomination. You see, in, in governments, in national governments, it's possible, not easy, not something we want to happen regularly, certainly, in, in our countries for sure, or really even in the countries of the world. We don't want there to be a lot of unrest, a lot of change, but it's possible, right? And sometimes it's a change for the better. I'm glad that we're still not under the monarchy of, of Great Britain. I'm glad that we have our own constitutional republic. I'm glad we have our own government that represents us better than it would uh, than, than they did at that time. I'm glad about that. But if we think about especially... In that, in that idea, how Great Britain, how the, how the king and queen, how those people in, in that time during the American Revolution, how they looked at these rebellious people trying to overthrow their government. And then we look to the church. I think sometimes if we, if we appreciate the, the mindset that the British may have had during that time, we might get a little idea of how God feels about it when people who claim to be Christians change the government of the church that he has established the way that things should be you see god is not just a king he's king of kings lord of lords he is god he's the one who says this is the way that i want it and while we can understand the the overthrowing of our government from a national perspective when when god says this is the way i want the leadership of the church to be how dare we change it how dare we try to make it better how dare we try to do anything different? And when we do, we're no longer a part of God's kingdom because it's a kingdom. If we place anything else above or change the structure of how God has said, this is what I want within the church of how it should be ruled, how it should be governed, how it should be cared for, then we stop listening to the king and therefore we no longer are his subjects. This morning in our 52-week series, we've reached uh, towards the, the end of our, our series, as we still have all the way through August, as we've mentioned recently. But uh, tonight, this morning, we're going to talk about church leadership and what it should look like. This evening, I hope that you'll come back. Caleb, our youth intern, is going to be preaching tonight. I look forward to his lesson, and I hope that you'll be back for that. That's why we're doing our 52-week series this morning. Church leadership. If there is to be a government of the church, how should the church be governed? How should the church be led? First of all, we must recognize, number one in your notes, we must first recognize what or who holds authority within Christianity. Let's notice a couple things that, that don't hold. Something that, that may have, maybe for you, certainly probably for some of your religious friends, uh, is something that is, is a temptation or something that, that is certainly held on to. The religion of those who have come before us. 
It is not what holds authority in governing the church. Perhaps uh, the, the religion or the, the thought process of our, our parents or our grandparents or ancestors from, from many years down the line, that is not what is the authority in governing anything in the church and, and, and showing us how we ought to live our lives. I'm going to mention a lot of verses this morning. I encourage you to, to write them down. We won't take the time to turn to a lot of them. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 51, Stephen there, right before, right before he gets stoned, calls the group of Jews that he is talking to. He says that they are stiff-necked. And we learn from that, that that there are many, certainly in the first century, and even so today, many have resisted necessary change as their forefathers did. Stephens tells the, the Jews in his day that you're, you're stiff-necked, you're stubborn, you're hard-headed, you won't listen, you won't change, just like your forefathers. You see, stubbornness is nothing new, is it? Stubbornness has been around for a long time. As long as humans have been around, stubbornness has been around. Just ask Eve. I'm sure Adam was stubborn, or vice versa. The, the stubbornness is always something that has been a part of who we are. And sometimes just because this is the way we've always done things, or this is the way my family has always done things, or this is the way someone that I respect has always done things, then that's going to be good enough for me. Specifically, when we think about our families in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, you know that verse. It's one of those hard verses that we read. If anyone loves father or mother more than me, he is not worthy of me. If anyone loves son or daughter more than me, he is not worthy of me. And we, we look in that verse, and, and there are other passages, parallel passages, that says, if you don't hate your father and mother, if you don't hate your children, you're not worthy of me. What is, what's Jesus trying to say there in Matthew 10, 37? If family devotion, my family's always done it this way, this is the way we do it. This is who we are. If family devotion trumps love for God, then we're not worthy. If we're thinking about this morning specifically with church leadership, just because we're a part of or have been a part of in the past a group of people that do things a certain way, that doesn't mean that it's right. That's not where the authority comes from. We can also think about that man's conscience or what you think or what I think is not the authority in what the church should do. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, it says, There is a way that seems right to a man, and its end is death. That's a sobering thought. The next time you think you're making a good decision, think about that verse. There's a way that seems right to a man. It seems like this is a good idea. This is what I should do. The proverb writer says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. We need to make sure that we do things in all aspects of our life, and certainly in the things that we do within the church as according to what God would have us to do. In Acts chapter 23, in verse 1, Paul is making his uh, defense before a, a group of people, and, and he tells them that he has lived with a, a good conscience all the days of his life. Now, Paul has done some pretty heinous things, hasn't he? Paul was there at the stoning of Stephen, perhaps, uh, perhaps the ringleader of that group, at the very least uh, being someone who, who consented or who approved of what happened to Stephen the martyr. He goes to, to, from city to city seeking to find Christians to throw into prison, to punish just because of their faith. But he says to this group he's talking to in Acts chapter 23 that he's lived with a good conscience every day of his life. Paul was sincere in his belief, but he was sincerely wrong at times. Sincerity alone, the way we think. I really think this is the right thing to do. I can feel it deep down in my heart. That doesn't mean that it's right. And it certainly doesn't mean that it's right. If we're going to be a part of the kingdom of God, we must listen to the king. We must listen to his commands and not our own thoughts. Praise God that the decision of the majority is not the authority of the governing of the church. Uh, in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 2, uh, God, God is giving some, some of the extra laws. He's given the Ten Commandments at this point, but He's giving many of the other laws. And it says in Exodus 23, 2, uh, God tells the uh, Israelites, He says, You shall not follow the masses in doing evil. You shall not follow the masses in doing evil. What does that tell us? The most of the time, the majority is not going to be doing what God would have them to do. So just because you're in the majority doesn't mean that you're right. 
Jesus echoes this sentiment in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, when he tells people to, the way is broad that leads to destruction. The gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. But what is, what's, the, what's the good way? The gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to eternal life. Just because we're with the majority doesn't mean that we are right. And then in Acts chapter 4, we find Peter and John... Uh, called again uh, before some Jews, and they say to them, "Whether it's you, you decide whether it's best for us to heed the thoughts of man or listen to the word of God. What should we do? What's the authority for how the church should be run, for how the kingdom should, be, should form and function? It is the word of God. God's word, the Bible, is the authority in governing the church. And not only in governing the church. We're going to talk about elders and deacons this morning, but we realize the greater context, Right? That the Bible is the authority for my life. If I want to know what to do, we talked about in our Bible class this morning in, in the, uh, one of the smaller Bible classes that if I want to know what is right, I am blessed that I have the Word of God that I can go to and find, okay, this is what God wants me to do. I, I can look at it. I can find it. I can know what God wants me to do because I have His Word. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, it teaches us that the scriptures and the meaning of scriptures and the interpretation of scriptures is not determined by the, the, the will of man, but determined by God. Men moved by the Holy Spirit wrote the scriptures. The, these scriptures are from God. We know from 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 that all scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete adequately, and adequately equipped for every good work. What does that tell us? Something that we already know. But we must remind ourselves as we're thinking about how should the kingdom be run? How should the kingdom form? How should the kingdom function according to the king's words? And in John chapter 12 and verse 48, Jesus says that we will be judged by his word. The word of God is the authority in all aspects of Christianity. Now again, God has given you free will. God has given me free will. God has given every person who's ever lived this life free will. You can do whatever you want to do. But if you want to be in the kingdom, you must listen to the king. We must listen to the word of God. It's his word. It's his kingdom. So what is, how is the church to be governed? What, what we must first recognize is what, what, what has the authority. God has that authority. And he has shown us what he wants us to do through his word. Number two, we see in scriptures that the Lord's church is a theocracy in its government. What does that mean? That means God's in charge. Again, it's not any individual, any individual person, any group of people. It is God ultimately who is in charge. God in Christ is the supreme head of the church. Scriptures tell us that in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, He, Jesus, is also the head of the body, the church. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, it says that, And He, God the Father, put all things in, su in subjection under His, that's Jesus, God the Son, under His feet, and gave Him as head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of who fills all in all. What is that telling us? God made Jesus the head of the church. Who's in charge? It's not me. It's not even our elders. It's not the, the best Christian that you know is not in charge of the church. God is in charge of the church. He has told us what we must do. And then Jesus claims this you know, as some of his final words uh, before he ascends into heaven. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Who has the authority? Jesus does. Jesus has this authority. Now, not all of, the, if you have a, a red letter edition of your, your Bible, you'll notice that not every single word in the New Testament is read. It's not that, uh, that, that every, every word that we see, Jesus literally spoke while he was here on this earth. So, so how, do we, how do we reconcile that? If it's going to be Jesus' word, he says, that, that judges us, if he has all authority. Well, Jesus covers this in John chapter 14 and verse 26. And also chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, Jesus promises the apostles that the Holy Spirit will come. The other part of the Godhead will come. And he would remind them of everything that Jesus said. Can you imagine having that when you were to, to take a test in, in school? Have something that reminded you of everything the teacher said? How great would that be, right? Well, Jesus says that, listen, I'm promising you that, that something is going to come. And, and he says specifically, he's going to remind you of everything I ever said. And he's going to teach you even more. What a blessing the Holy Spirit was for those apostles to, to be able to, to have that knowledge and to be able to relay that to them. 
And also, uh, we see again in First Peter, excuse me, Second Peter, chapter one and verse twenty-one, that every scripture is inspired by God. It's not an interpretation of of any man or any woman or any person's will. Uh, scripture doesn't mean what I want it to mean. It doesn't mean what you want it to mean. It doesn't mean what I think it means. It means what God made it mean. I could be wrong. You could be wrong. But what it means is what God meant for it to mean. And that's what it will always mean. And I just said mean a whole lot. But you, you get it, right? That, that you may have, and this certainly happens in the world today, doesn't it? Different people have different interpretations, different ideas about what something may mean. Well, th that scripture teaches us, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, your interpretation isn't right. My interpretation isn't right. What the Bible says and what the Bible means is right. And we need to make sure that our thinking is in line with what scripture says. We've got to make sure that we do that. The authority to lay out the governing of the church laid at the feet of, the, of Jesus, of his apostles, and those inspired writers as they were directed by God. So let's answer the question finally. Number three, what role does man play in church leadership? And why is it important? Why is it important? Let's think about that. Again, go back to the, the idea, the example of one government can, throw, can overthrow another government or one group of people can overthrow their, their own government. And, and we, we can change and we can switch around and, and we can go from, from this type of government to that type of government. And we have that ability and we can do that. And, and maybe even the, the majority of the people want that to happen. Maybe it's, it's a, a good change. There's, there's no change of God's law, of God's plan, of God's form or, or function of the church that is good. There's no change. Of what God has said that can be good. So that's why it's important. What role does man play in church leadership? We see in scriptures that elders play a part in governing the church. Some may ask, well, what's an elder? And that's another lesson for another time. Uh, but Patrick read to us this morning the list of qualifications for an elder. Uh, the list of things that, that, a, that a man must do. That a man must have it as part of who he is to, to be an elder or to be a deacon. It, it is defined in Scripture, though. We, we see that in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 and following. Titus, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, we see these qualifications of, of what it means to be an elder. Scripture teaches us that there must be uh, multiple elders in every con congregation. What I want us to think about this morning, though, is what is an elder's duty? What must an elder do? We have five elders here at the Charlotte Avenue Congregation, and I believe we have fantastic elders. This will be a, a reminder for them and a reminder for us. As we think about that, I want us to, to, to think about it from this perspective. There are three words that are used in New Testament for this singular office of what we call elder. Uh, there is one that is bishop, one that is elder, and one that is shepherd. And I want us to think about what's in a name. Why are, why are the, the men who hold these offices, why are they called by these names? And I think that will tell us a good bit about what they are supposed to be doing. Uh, the word for bishop, or the word that is bishop in, in the Greek is, uh, ep, mm -hmm, I'm not a Greek scholar. I knew I was going to stutter when I said this, so David will get me later, I'm sure. Don't worry. Uh, eskapos, sure. Something along those lines. And it, it's a, it's a compo compound world, uh, that com com compound word, there you go, uh, that comes from epi, which means to, to look or to watch, and scopio, which means uh, to see over. That was backwards. Epi means over, uh, and scopio means to look or to watch. What does it mean to, uh, to be a bishop? It means to, to oversee. But when I think of that word oversee, I, I think of movies where people are on an assembly line and they have someone who's standing up above and they're, they're overseeing. And it's a very, you know, they're, they're, they're worried when, the, when the, the manager or the overseer comes by and, and you know, you've got to make sure that you're, you're really on top of it then. And, and I, I get a negative connotation when I, when I hear the word oversee. It's, it's a right word. Scripture uses that word. It's not, it's not bad. But another way is overseer, one who looks over. What about this one? Still from the same, same word, one who watches over. That, to me, that sounds different. To me, that has a different meaning. One who watches over you versus an overseer. Both are accurate. Both are right. But one who watches over you, I, I get the idea of someone who cares for you. Someone who watches over you. Someone who wants to help you. Someone who is there for you. This is the idea of what an elder is supposed to do. Uh, the word for elder is presbyteros. I think I got that one right. Uh, and it points to an individual, individual's age. 
or their maturity or experience and understanding. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6, it says that an elder should not be a new convert. Shouldn't be someone who's just become a Christian. Why is that? Because we want our leaders to be experienced. We want our leaders to be mature. When you look for a leader in any aspect of life, you want someone who, who has been there, who has done that, who has experienced it. In reality, who has had failure and learned how to deal with it, and who has learned how to succeed. That's what we need in leaders, and that's what we need in elders. When we think about someone who is an elder, it's not just their age. Just because someone is older does not mean that they should be an elder. Just because someone is a good person does not mean that they should be an elder. There's a difference between a good person and a good leader. We want our leaders to be good people, but not every good person is a good leader. Uh, elders should be mature, should have experience, should have understanding. And then the last word for shepherd is pomane, and it is to protect, to provide, or to care for. Maybe perhaps similar to someone who watches over you. And, and that's, the, that's the picture. We've had lessons on that before. Perhaps you remember the idea that the elders are used, or the, the description of an elder is, is a shepherd. There are other types of, uh, of livestock that, uh, that were cared for during the first century. That, that they could have used that person, that, that caretaker, but they used a shepherd. And, and a shepherd was constantly, and, and even today, is constantly with the sheep. Has to be with them, has to care for them, sees them when they wake up. The first thing that the, shep that the sheep sees, uh, the first person at least, is, is the shepherd. And they're there. They're constantly there. They care for them. They help them. They lead them to those quiet waters. They lead them to that green grass. That's what our elders are supposed to be doing. Elders, that's what we're supposed, you're supposed to be doing. Leading us to that quiet water. Leading us to that green grass. Feeding us and taking care of us and helping us. That's the job of an elder. What are some responsibilities of elders to a congregation? Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. We'll read verses 1 through 3. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3. Let's look at, uh, for our next couple of moments here, the responsibility of, uh, responsibilities of elders to a congregation, and then the responsibilities of a congregation to its elders. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, Peter speaking here says, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder, okay, so here's an elder talking to elders, and witness of the suffering of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. He tells them, I exhort the elders among you, verse 2, shepherd the flock, of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, not yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but providing or proving to be an example to the flock. What is one responsibility of an elder to its congregation, to his congregation? To provide an example. Elders, how important that is for you to provide an example to your sheep. That God has given you of this is what a Christian is supposed to be like. In Acts chapter 20, Paul is traveling uh, to Jerusalem, probably believing that he is uh, about to die. He tells the, uh, the people that he meets with, the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, that he'll never see them again. And in some of his last words, it says in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he says to these elders, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which He purchased with His own blood. There's a lot for elders and a lot for us to understand about elders just in that one verse. But be on guard for the flock is the point that we want to get this morning. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17 it says, Obey your leaders. So here's something for us as members of the congregation, but it also speaks to a job of an elder. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls. Elders, your job is to watch over not the people of the congregation, but the souls of the congregation. What an awesome responsibility. In 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse 2, it says to shepherd the flock or to feed the flock. Our elders are in charge of making sure that what is taught, uh, not only from the pulpit, but in our Bible classes, and in every aspect from an from a official church stance, is, is right, is scriptural, is correct. Our elders are also supposed to admonish us. What does that mean? To instruct for the purpose of correction. Sometimes we might get out of line. Sometimes I get out of line, and I get corrected more often than I'd like. No, uh, <laughs> as often as I need. Uh, but sometimes, Christians, you struggle, don't you? You ever do something that you're not supposed to do? You ever had an elder come to you and try and help you? I hope you have. I hope if you've been in that situation that an elder has come to you and tried to help you. 
because that's one of their jobs, is to admonish. And then in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, it tells us, Paul says of his example to those Ephesians elders, that he showed them that they, they are to work hard to support the weak. Elders, work hard to support the weak. What about the, some responsibilities of the congregation to its elders? Uh, it tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, that good elders, which I believe that we have five of the here, uh, work hard at preaching and teaching, and they are to be esteemed. They are to be admired. They are to be listened to. They are to be respected. Listen, it's not because of the, the office alone, though the office should be respectable, but it's because of the respectable men who fill that office. We are also supposed to protect them. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, if you want to take the time later to, to read that, that whole section there, it talks a good bit about a congregation's responsibility to its elders. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, it tells us when, when someone comes to you and says, your elder has been doing this, it basically says, in summation, give your elder the benefit of the doubt because of who they are, because of who they're supposed to be. But it also says that if they're guilty, then you publicly rebuke them. The elders have an awesome responsibility, but we as the church, we as the congregation should give our elders the benefit of the doubt. And then go back to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. We are to remember them. Remember those who lead you. Remember them. Let's pray for them who spoke the word of God to you and consider the result of their conduct and imitate their faith. Follow the example that our elders give to us. And then go back again to Hebrews 13, 17. What do, what do we owe our elders? Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them. Listen, ultimately we submit to God. Ultimately we submit to Christ. He's the head of the church. But as we have, and I believe we do, as we have God-fearing, Christ-following elders, when they make decisions, we should follow their command. We should follow their direction. We should follow them. Why? Why? Because they're going to give an account for our souls. They're trying to do what is best for us. We may not always agree with them, but we should submit to them. We should, again, Hebrews 13, 17, it's not me saying it. It's God saying, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. What an awesome responsibility they have. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Our elders often do things with joy, but sometimes they would probably tell you that they have to do some things with grief. When that is the way it is, Scripture tells us that's unprofitable for us. We need to listen to our elders, to obey them, to submit to them, to uh, watch, because they're watching over us and they have our best in interest in mind. Briefly, what about deacons? Deacons also play a part in the governing of a church. Scripture teaches us that there are also qualifications for those who hold this office. You can find those in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8-13. through 13. But what's, again, what's a deacon's duty? What is a deacon supposed to do? Similarly to how we looked at the names for an elder, there are, there's a name specifically given for a deacon. And that, that word is dequanos. It means servant, minister, one who renders help and service to others. We have a number of deacons here. I'm not even sure what the, what the number, of it, number is. Maybe 12, 16, something along those lines. We've got a number of, of men who are supposed to be our servants. Now, we're all supposed to be servants. All Christians are supposed to be servants. But these are special servants. They have a specific jobs. They fill specific needs. And the greatest example of this we find in Scripture is in, As in Acts chapter 6. In the early church, there were lots of... Christians all, all gathered in one place, probably at least 5,000 by Acts, Acts, Acts chapter 6. And some of the widows were being neglected. And the, they, they come to the apostles and they say, hey, our, our widows are being neglected. What, what, what can we do? Can you take care of this? And the apostles say, hey, we're busy trying to spread the word of God. We've got other responsibilities. Similarly to how elders have other responsibilities, other things they need to be taken care of. And so they say, you choose seven men. And the same word for deacon is used. These men are not necessarily the first deacons, but they are doing the work that deacons do today. Deacons make sure that things get done. Deacons, listen to that. It's not always easy. Sometimes you may not feel like you always have as much direction as you need. Sometimes you may not know what to do, deacons. But the idea of what a deacon is, is someone who gets things done and allows the elders to continue on in their work. 
of overseeing or watching over or caring for the church and making sure the gospel message is being spread. Deacons are important. And deacons shouldn't be the only ones doing whatever work they're in charge of. They're just there to make sure it gets done. That doesn't mean that other brothers and sisters in Christ that aren't elders or aren't deacons can't help them with that. Just because a deacon is in charge of an area doesn't mean that he should do all of the work in that area. What is biblical church leadership? Christ is the head of the church. If you find a group of people who claim to be Christians and say anything else, they've changed what the king has said, and they're no longer a part of the kingdom. He must be ahead of the, the head of the church. He has all rule and all authority. Every congregation must have elders and must have multiple elders, Scripture teaches us. They must care for and guide and correct the church. And deacons can be appointed to help serve the congregation and to help the community. Deacons, you lead in service and you lead through service. But what about you? Maybe you're not an elder. Maybe you're not a deacon. What about you? Members, you're Christians. That means that you submit to Christ. You submit to Christ following elders and you assist Christ following elder directed deacons. What does it mean? What, what's, the, what's the takeaway this morning? Two things. First of all, you can't change what the king says and be a part of his kingdom. God has said very plainly what the church leadership should look like. If you want to look at it, the, the front of your bulletins this morning is a, is a, a pretty good example, a pretty good uh, image of, of what God has designed church leadership to look like. If it looks like anything else, it's not what the king has said, and therefore we're no longer a part of his kingdom if we change that. But secondly, what does it mean for us? Turn to Ephesians chapter 4 as we close this morning. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. It says this, And he, that's God, gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by, way, by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Elders have a role to play in the church. Deacons have a role to play in the church. And you have a role to play in the church. God has given you the talents and the abilities that you have. God has placed you where you're at, and He wants to and He can use you for the building up of the body of Christ. Not just the building up of these people, of us gathered here today, but also the building up through adding people who are lost to this body. May that be our goal. May that be our aim, to see the kingdom of God grow each and every day. If you have any needs, if you have any requests to be made known, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. Uh -huh.